because that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. And it does actually look like White Black Midrange. All right, so he's got Seeker of the Way, Herald of Torment, Bramaz, and Wingmate Rock, along with Raise the Alarm, Heroes Downfall, Thoughtseize, Bile Blight, Soren, Sound Visitor, all in varying numbers. For Brad, one thing you know about him, he's kind of a metagame expert, especially when it does come to standard. And so he switches things up quite a bit. You remember his Pro Tour deck, Red White with an aggro deck game one, sideboard in, and hostilities and planeswalkers for game two and game three. Mardu at the Grand Prix last weekend, and now he's got a white black mid range deck. So he's always shifting things around, and he's starting game number one here with a Scoured Barons to go up to 21. Which is surprising given that he top eight at the Grand Prix last week. It's not like he had a bad result with his deck. Mm -hmm. But Brad has always been very quick to switch decks, even top eighting winning tournaments. I remember he had very good success last year or two years ago with a Naya mid-range deck with uh, Symbol of Legion in the main deck yep. and ditched that deck immediately the next week, even though he did very well with it. So not uncommon for Brad. Mike Grinsteiner has a Foundry Street Denizen and a Mountain to start things off. He's on Mono Red Aggro. He does have Goblin Rabble Master in his main deck. We have seen some players slant away from that card, but he does have four copies of that. He's also got a Foundry Street Denizen. He will play a Fire Drunker Cedar make the Denizen a little bit bigger and attack here for two, but that means that Seeker of the Way is going to live, and that's exactly where you want to be in this matchup if you're Brad. He'll start by attacking for two. I think Seeker of the Way is one of the most important cards in the format that you could be playing to try to help the mono red matchup. Uh, you need to do something on turn two, and even if you draw it later on in the game, it can still be really impactful. One could argue that this is the perfect curve against the mono red deck. Seeker of the Way into Burma's King of Oreskos. Grinsteiner stuck on one land right now, too, with his mono red deck. Burma's is really difficult for them to get through, even if he had two or three lands. It's a huge beating. There's four copies to Stoke the Flames. That's a good out to Bermaz here, but unchecked, you know, the tokens that Brad generates with the Bermaz are pretty close in quality to the cards that are in Mike's hand. So Bermaz unchecked just runs away with the game. Hammerhand's gonna come in. It will make it so that Bermaz cannot block, so some damage will come across there for Mike. But Brad has a really nice board here. He's at 15, so he's not too low. Now he can start getting to work on the life total. He can also cast a hero's downfall to get this Foundry Denison out of the way. That'll trigger prowess for the Seeker, which means that Brad will be gaining some life and dealing a lot of damage this turn. I like getting rid of the Foundry Street Denison here because he can really only lose this game if Mike has some very explosive turns. The Fire Drinker here is not going to be enough to really keep Mike in this game. So even though the Foundry Street Denison is probably worse, it is it represents more raw power, potentially, than the Fire Drinker Seder does. I imagine also there will be a situation where the Fire Drinker Seder will have to block, which, as we know, is not very effective. Yeah. Grinsteiner will draw a card here. Looks like he picked up a copy of Coordinated Assault, but that's not a land as he does go through his grip here. There's a Dragon's Mantle kind of hanging out over there. It looks like a Prone Crusader as well. But I think he knows he's in some serious trouble. Vermaz is one of the best cards you can have in the format against Fauna Red, and Seeker of the Way is not that much further down the list. With Brad on the play with those cards against an opponent who still has not found land number two, not a lot to be done. You can see Mike kind of shaking his head. He knows he's stuck on mana. And even if he did have mana, I'm not sure he could work himself out of this situation. These are two of the premier threats against Mono Red. I think we expect to see Mono Red pick up after Dylan Murphy getting second place with it in Worcester last weekend. Brad's deck is all about the Mono Red matchup. I mean, he's first of all, he's two colors, so his mana is very stable, comes into play on time. Second, he's playing, you know, four copies of Raise the Alarm alongside a lot of cheaper removal. Raise the Alarm's got to be one of the better cards you can have against Mono Red. So dense and one toughness creatures. We can't forget about the four copies of Soren Solemn Visitor as well, granting lifelink both on offense and defense. That's got to be a pain for Mono Red as well. Nelson going to attack here with everybody. And a Bile Blight is going to clear out that Acronan Crusader. That'll trigger prowess on the Seeker yet again. That'll make it a 3 through with a little lifelink action. As Brad works his, works his way towards closing this game out, I think, pretty easily at this point. Probably needs one more attack step. Yeah, still four cards in hand. Yeah. And this is really just all about Bermaz. Very hard for Mono Red to beat if they don't have Stoke the Flames on the spot. Brad Nelson going to win game number one here over Mike Grinsteiner. White-black mid-range up a game here over Mono Red Aggro. As we do head to the sideboards, we will start with Mono Red. Two copies of Lightning Strike go up to the third and fourth copy here. Two copies of Hall Triumph. Uh, coordinated Assault, two in the main deck, and then one more on the board. Two copies of Searing Blood, two Magma Spray, two Circle of Flame, and four Eidolon and the Great Rebel. I suppose the two Searing Bloods can come in here because he's seen Seeker of the Way, and Bermaz also helps turn on... Uh, Turn it on with either blocking inside of combat or by going after tokens. Besides that, probably not a lot of sideboard to be done here. Well, we already knew his game one matchup was pretty good. It's only going to get better. Two reprisals, two erase. Those aren't too exciting. Either of these two copies of Thoughtseize. 
You see a silence of believers in the suspension field. Again, not all that exciting. Three swords of the Pantheon, good for trading, and then three copies of Drowning Sorrow. Brad's not messing around with this matchup this weekend, yeah, that's for a sure. A hater in the house, my goodness. He does not want to lose this deck. Drowned Sorrow also synergizes nicely with Seeker of the Way, too. Sure does. Obviously good with threats like Vermaz, Wingmate Rock. Brad is definitely respecting the modern red matchup this weekend, no doubt about it. The most interesting inclusion in this deck to me, the four copies of Herald's Torment. So he doesn't have a lot of creatures in his deck. He has, you know, a, a pretty good amount. Four Seekers, four Vermaz, four Wingmate Rock. Though I don't, I don't foresee, you know, Herald Torment being bestowed on Wingmate Rock or the token, but he's also got these four copies of Raise the Alarm and then the Vampires that Soren can make. I wouldn't be surprised more often than not, Brad is just casting Herald Torment as just a three mana 3-3 three, three to curve out. Well, I think that Flying is very good in the format right now in fighting the Obson decks. Uh, they're so good at clogging up the ground with Carry Added and Corsair, Siege Rhino, that Flying's valuable. Herald Torment's not a bad deal on either side. If you're casting it, that's fine. And if you're bestowing it, that's fine. And it's probably a concession to the Obson matchup, which I would suspect it's a little bit worse the way that Brad's constructed his deck, giving up so much equity trying to fight the aggressive decks. Well, while these players do finish up sideboarding, we will talk about SCG game night. It used to be every Wednesday. Now it's every week in October. There's one week left to get these things. October's almost over. Yeah, we're almost at the end of the month here. This is supposed to be fun and friendly. It can be sanctioned, certainly, but a little bit more casual, focus, organized play. We send out new kits of tokens and foils every month. This is the October collection that you're seeing here. So if you're interested in getting this program set up, it's very easy. Head over to starseedgames.com slash game night for more information. Tournament organizer, store owners, you want to get this hooked up. Uh, just get more players playing in your store. You have the liberty to run the format however you want to. Uh, just make sure that you're giving out the pins and the foils and that people are having a good time. Who's your daddy is Who's our token and pin for right now. We'll see what November is next weekend when the Open Series does come to Oakland. Maybe something turkey themed? I haven't seen it. So I haven't seen it either. Guess. I would like a turkey token. Yeah. Are there, no, there, are no, there are no turkeys in Magic, though, I don't think. That's true. That's too bad. Well, we do... Turkey block, perhaps? We do, a lot of, we do a lot of penguin tokens, and Magic isn't really that much of a penguin-focused IP. I suppose that's actually true. So... We could know. gobble gobble. That might be too late. I don't know if we've pitched this idea. Yeah, we... It's too late I, now. We need to get our our fingers into more pies over at SEG. Because every time we're on the air, we have all these great ideas. That's true. But I just don't think they get communicated to the right channels, you know? What do you think for Christmas? Is it time for reindeer? Or can we do better? Uh, reindeer's pretty sweet. OK. All right. We'll look into that. Green, red split card. See, I'm thinking one step ahead. Mm -hmm. It's got to be green and red. Gruel Reindeer yep. is the name of the card. I have it. And if they do that, I want my I want my cut. Exactly. That's all. That's what this is really about. I, I want to cut. I want to wet my beak. Yeah. <laughs> Brad Nelson currently up a game here over Mike Grinsteiner. We'll see if Mono Red can tie things up, but it does not look great as far as the deck list are concerned. Nelson has a pretty uh, pretty tough deck slanted towards beating Mono Red, especially with the sideboarded Drown and Sorrows as well. Brad it looks like has no interest in losing to this deck on this weekend. Play versus draw is a big deal, though. I mean... Mike losing this match two games to one would not surprise me. He just sure. has a really good draw on the play. The spot of red deck's very hard to beat when they're on the play with one of their good hands. And we have just been told right now that Todd Anderson, Brad's buddy, partner in crime, lost round one. Don't know what Todd's playing. Haven't got to see him yet this morning. Wouldn't be surprised if he's on the same deck that Brad is on, but a tough start here for him after taking the trip out here. Starts off 0-1. And if you look at the amount of time left in the round, his loss was pretty quick. Didn't take long. Mike is going to keep. Brad will as well. Game number two is underway with a mountain into good old Swifty. Bang. Mo Monastery Swift Spears in for one. Nelson going to draw a card here. See, he's got a swamp. Picked up a copy of Caves Colios. He will play that swamp and pass the turn back. So over to Grinsteiner, we're going to go. He picks up a copy of Dragon's Mantle. Already had one of those. He will cast the new one. This will allow him to cantrip and trigger prowess. So the Monastery Swiss will be a 2-3, and it looks like Mike is still stuck on one land. The thing about this deck is it only plays 17 of them. Sometimes you see it go up to 18, but Mike's on the 17 land build, and now he's in all sorts of trouble if he can't draw a land to kill the Seeker of the Way. And the Corona Crusader is what he drew for the turn, so again, not a land here for him. Nelson did have to pay a life from the Caves of Coleos to actually play the Seeker of the Way, but that is kind of the roadblock and the hang-up here for red decks. It's no core Firewalker, but it is pretty good against these red decks. All you need to do is get enough action going on early on in the game to allow your Waymate Rots to take over later on. So 
even just as a 2-2 for two, it's going to improve your mono-red matchup. And then uh, there are going to be some games where it just runs away. Grandsteiner did miss again with the cantrip off the Dragon Mantle. Got to get in there for two, so Nelson's down to 14. For Nelson, he drew and played a Temple of Silence. You see he's scrying right now. Consulting the grip, figuring out what he wants to do with that top card of the deck. He's going to leave it on top, it looks like to me. We'll see if he's got anything to play here now. And maybe not. Perhaps that's going to go to the bottom here for Brad. A little unsure of himself early this morning. But it will stay. Here is an attack for two. Doesn't look like he has some sort of instant. And he will just pass the turn back without triggering prowess on the Seeker. So Grimsteiner is going to untap with his 1-2 Monastery Swiss Spear. And it looks like not draw another land again. So I think Brad has Drown and Sorrow in hand, which means he's not really in any rush to do anything. It's going to let Mike build up a little bit of a board, Drown Sorrow everything away, and then take over from there. Michael attack for one play a Foundry Chief Denizen and pass the turn back over to Nelson. Nelson draws a copy of Soldier of the Pantheon. As you did mention, there is a Drown and Sorrow hanging out in Nelson's hand. He also has Nurborg. This will be a Soren Solemn Visitor. The elevator's going up to five. This will be an attack here for four, actually. You've got your prowess, plus you've got Soren growing things a little bit. I think it's double lifelink as well, but that won't happen twice. And if Mike has some sort of follow-up here to trigger the Founder of Denizen and try to get the Soren off the table, that plays right into Brad Stroud and Sorrow. That's the big trick. As Mike finally draws his second land, slams that directly into play. So there's the potential for that Soren to bite the dust, but Brad is clearly reeling him into a really backbreaking Drown and Sorrow at this point. Yeah, it would have to be something like Mike using coordinated assault to get the Soren off the table, but it's going to be really hard for him to be Drown and Sorrow given just how far behind he is at this point and how his hand is essentially just creatures. There is a Lightning Strike there as well. So a Lightning Strike plus the attacks. And he actually could sneak in a point of damage too if he Lightning Strikes the Soren and then the Swift Sword will become a 2-3. That'll finish it off, and then he can actually get in one point of damage with the Foundry Dungeon, too. The other option that Mike has here is just his Lightning Strike, the Seeker, the way out of the way. Attack Soren for three, and say, okay, you can generate a 2-2 token next turn, or a plus Soren on an empty board. Out of these things is fine. Looks like he's going to go after the Soren with the Lightning Strike, finish it off with the Swift Spear plus the Prowess Trigger, and then the Denizen will come across for one. Put Nelson down to 16, and Nelson will untap and draw a copy of Heroes Downfall in for two. He's going to come. Perhaps it's time for a Wingmate Rock? If it is, I've got some bad news for Mike. And that's the bad news. Two 3-4s on the way. And Mike's entire deck on the table is not better than two 3-4 flyers. So. I unfortunately <laughs> think that that's true. I think that that is true. Here is the rock. You know, players were a little skeptical about this card to start. Well, it's it's tough because the raid, the, the raid text box sort of implies you need to be putting this into an aggressive deck. And it's a five mana creature, so it's pretty easy to talk yourself out of. But... You don't have to be playing a straight beatdown deck to be maximizing this. This is so powerful in mid-range strategies. Abzan most notably, and Brad can incorporate it very easily into his black-white shell as well. You will find a way to get an attacker through, it seems like most times. You know, between the Vampire token with Soren, again, Nelson does have four copies of Raise the Alarm. I, I will say, I'm interested to see, you know, how many people Brad may catch off guard with Raise the Alarm this weekend. I think it's going to be a lot. Not a card you see much of in Standard, and Brad's deck doesn't even have a lot of token synergies in it. There's mm -hmm. nothing to really suggest that that's what's going on besides Soren, I guess. Feels kind of out of place. Yeah. What's it doing in there? Well, it's very good against Mono Red because they have so many X ones in their deck. Mm -hmm. Grim Steiner does have a Stoke the Flames in hand. Just trying to figure out the best way to use this card, see if he can get out from underneath this situation because it's not a great one here for Mike. That is Necron Crusader. This is a copy of Eidolon of the Great Rebel, and that will be a Stoke the Flames with Convoke to take care of the actual copy of Ring It Rock. The bird is still around as Nelson does draw a card, and Nelson quickly slides Drown and Sorrow forward in his hand. Well, the first order of business should be Brad attacking, because Mike has no blockers available. He, I guess, I suppose he might have some interest in actually gaining a little bit of life right now. I can see, you know, if he attacks, he gets more damage across. This way he gains... A, only, I guess, one he life. He only gains so, one versus yeah. giving up four points of damage. Sure. So I think I would just attack first. That's fair. Nelson will follow up with an attack here. Get a couple of points of damage through. Gain a little bit of life. Does look like he missed out on a little bit of damage due to the sequencing of the turn. But more importantly, he's cleared all the creatures away on Grinsteiner's board. And a couple blockers to follow things up with. Yeah. Two copies sold to the Pantheon. 
it's good to cast those after the draft. So that's good. See, that's key. That's great sequencing. Yeah. And Brad, with Hero's downfall left over after all this is said and done. And one thing we know about this mono red deck, not a deck that's really great at blocking, as most mono red decks really typically are not. Well, everything about this deck is about playing out with the front foot. Yeah. I mean, it's all about getting some stuff into play, pushing through blockers, and finishing off the game before the opponent can do very much. It does not play very well at all from this position. Goblin Rabble Master going to come in and attack here for one as Brad does top deck and play a Soren Solemn Visitor. Elevator going up on all of those creatures. And this is just lethal. And that is going to do it. Brad Nelson going to win this match over Mike Grinsteiner. Two games to zero. White Black Midrange will take down Mono Red Aggro early this morning from Minneapolis. As again, Nelson's deck list very geared and slanted towards beating Mono Red with the creatures that he has, the spells that he's playing, and then the Drowned Sorrows in the sideboard. What I really like, too, is that Brad's committing to beating it game one. Most yep. of the decks we see in the format, game one against Mono Reds can be really challenging for them, and they're leaning on Drowned and Sorrows or Anger of the Gods to catch the matchup for them. Brad's matchup is acceptable in game one with the Raise the Alarms, the Cheap Removal, the Low Base, the Staple Mana. So he's definitely gunning for it this weekend. Yeah, this is the deck that he has.